Hello and welcome back once again to the Chris Ott channel where I've been going um, through a series of talks on cause, causation. And this is the, sec um, the second actual discussion. The first part was just going over some meanings of some words. Um, I had said that um, I was going to be discussing the subject of knowledge, which in a philosophy is called epistemology, and, and what that means is the things that, that um, where we reflect on what we know, and how we know it, and whether we really know it, and, uh, and what it would take to really absolutely know something for certain. That's what we're talking about. And I was going to go into that in, in some depth, but I've decided that um, it's better for the listener to to not get overloaded with those things that can be a little extraneous. For now, we just need to, to know what we need to know to get back to the subject of cause. So, first of all, I want to say, sort of, jump to the chase and say um, get to what we really know and, and how. Okay, first of all um, when we talk about knowledge in, in, this, in this context we're talking, uh, much like in the, when I talked about cause, I said we were talking about cause in its strictest um, sense of that which is absolutely, you know, responsible. And, um, likewise here, when we're talking about knowledge, we mean knowledge in its most absolute sense where there's absolute certainty and there and um, through you could see no way that you could possibly be wrong okay that kind of certainty is very hard to achieve which we'll talk about in just a moment but it's also usually in daily life not necessary so for instance uh, let's say um, I have to go to a meeting and um, I can't remember what time the meeting was, and I ask my wife, and she tells me the meeting is at 9. Now I'm on my way to the meeting. You know, my wife could have, um, could have remembered wrong, or she could have heard wrong uh, over the phone, or she could have, um, or the meeting could have um, been canceled, but we didn't hear about it, or the time changed, or... Um, uh, but be between my leaving the house and arriving for the meeting, the building where the meeting was supposed to happen could have burned down. So I don't really absolutely know there's a meeting at nine. But for daily living purposes, uh, I, I have a sufficient enough um, certainty of it that in way more than 99% of the cases, everything's going to work out. You can arrive. The meeting probably did start at 9, and even if it didn't, it's not the end of the world. You know, we'll reschedule the meeting, or I'll catch up on what happened at the meeting, etc. So, um, and another example, um, if you, you know, if you go to a place and you've not been there before, and you sit down in a chair, you don't know with absolute certainty that that chair can hold you, can hold your weight. For all you know, it, it could have a problem and somebody just walked away while it was being glued and it wasn't dried yet and it could collapse and you could break your back. That's possible. You don't know. But, you know, we sit down in chairs all the time and for the most part, we get most people get through their whole life and uh, chairs don't break. So... That general sense of, well, all the chairs were good in the past, this one's probably good, that generally is sufficient. So there's lots of examples, but we just don't need to know with that level of certainty. We just need to have a very high 
sense that uh, you know of probability. Now, so in philosophy, when we're talking about absolute knowledge, it could be for some philosophers it's purely academic, but in our case, it's more than academic. It's not just um, an exercise. It'll actually be seen to be very important later when we return to the subject of cause. Okay. So, it is, has always been generally agreed that mere perception is not sufficient justification for being absolutely certain of something. Uh, you know, um, there's a movie called Rashomon by Kira Kurosawa, um, one of the most famous Japanese filmmakers who's now dead. And uh, in the film, there's an incident and witnesses um, report what they saw, and they all saw something else. Now why this is, is because interpretation of what we perceive is different from person to person, based on their angle of view, based on their preconceptions. And that's why, in spite of having, you know, eyewitnesses in trials all the time, they come back with DNA tests and find out that people have spent their life in prison when that didn't commit the crime even though it was, uh, there was a witness. So that's what we normally mean when we say that perception is not sufficient to, to, um, to appeal to for absolute certainty. Um, and if we take this to its philosophical extreme, which um, for the exercise of it, it has been long noticed that um, you know, you could be dreaming. <laughs> or, in the modern, there's a modern uh, thought experiment that demonstrates that seeing isn't believing, and um, it's the thought experiment that you could be hooked up like in the ma like Neo is in the Matrix to uh, a computer that's feeding you, um, you know, electrical signals that your brain is interpreting as what you th see, smell, and all that. As a matter of fact, there's even a uh, modern, um, there are people who believe that that's the case, and it's called the holographic universe theory, uh, that there's some higher um, civilization that does have us, you know, hooked up like that to seeing a simulated world, and but there's not, it doesn't represent reality, it's just, it's an it's a electrical simulation. Now, I'm not proposing that. And that's not my point, and it's a little off topic, all that, but it makes the point that um, perception uh, by our senses is not sufficient to know the truth. Now, there is one thing that you know with absolute certainty. There really is only one that you absolutely could not possibly conceive, conceive of a theory by which you could be wrong. And let me state this carefully. It might uh, be uh, sound strange at first. It is absolutely undeniable. Let me say this from my first person perspective. I look around the room, I listen to the sounds, I hear the birds outside. It appears to me I'm in a room, that the room is so big, all these factors, that there's so those things on the walls. Now, even if that's true, um, even if that were false, and even if that was just a bunch of electrical stuff, you know, being fed to my brain or something like that, or an evil demon, you know, fooling me with, uh, you know, false images as, as just an evil trick. It would still be true that all this presents as it does. This experience presents itself in the way that it does. Now, there's a mistake you can make. You can go too far. 
because um, and I was very careful to word that so I didn't make that mistake. The mistake is to presuppose that you can deduce from that that there's somebody perceiving it. Rene Descartes famously did that when he says, I think, therefore I am. Actually, that's a false deduction because when he, by the time he finished saying, I think, he had already presupposed that he existed. He didn't learn it from the, ex from the presentation, uh, from the experience. He already assumed it. It's just a, 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 an ideology he had coming from his uh, Catholic background. But, it, um, no, things just, it's just as possible that, oh, and another false thing is so, there's something presenting this to someone. Oh, where are you getting all these things? Um, I don't see, look around, I don't see anybody being presented to him. When I see my body, it's not the same thing as what Descartes meant. Um, because that's part of what I perceive and what presents. So those notions you have to discard. It doesn't follow from the presentation that there's somebody, you know, putting on a show and somebody receiving the show. All that you can, can, can know from the fact that things present as they do is that they present as they do. That would be true even if there was nobody here experiencing it. The experience itself is occurring. That is the one undeniable reality. Nothing can then be uh, truly uh, deduced or induced from the fact that things present as they do. Because, like, uh, to try to do that, you would be, have to presuppose that something in it was real. I'm not presupposing that it's real or unreal or any thought like that. I'm just saying, well, whatever, it presents as it does. Things appear as they do. And note, I'm not saying to me. I'm just saying things appear as they do. Now there's another category of belief that I would say we also know, but it's a much bigger um, subject and much more complicated and hard to explain. But I'm going to try. Now this camera may stop in, in five minutes. I haven't tested it this far before, but. I've read that the camera will stop after 20 minutes and then I'll have to get up and, and then we'll weave the video together later. So I'm, but I'm going to try to make a start on this subject of um, what are called intuitions. Okay, It's a big subject because intuitions require a, a, a a, per, a pretty deep understanding of certain theories of thought by which which make a case why they would be true and have to be true and that I, I don't want to go into right now I just want to say that it's generally agreed that there are certain things that we all sense that we know which we do not learn from um, experience, and we don't even learn it from logic. So uh, an example of that would be, you know, one plus one is two. I didn't discover that by logic, and I didn't discover it by uh, looking at one thing and another thing and then counting them, because I'm talking about one plus one is always two, which is a different it's a different uh, proposition for me to say one plus one was two before the world 
<laughs> and after the world burns out and the sun's gone and there's no one here, that's a pretty strong, powerful statement. How do I know that? I can't time travel. I can't live in that world. There's nothing in that world, okay? Before or after there is a world. So, um, now I'm not saying that there is one thing and another thing and they're added together, they're two things. I'm saying the statement that one plus one is two really means if there were one and another, they would be two. That's what I'm saying would be true. Okay. Now, relevant to our discussion, the intuition that's, that's relevant is the intuition that all people have that everything must have a cause or at least an, an explanation. There must be a reason for everything to be. There's some account for it. It's not just, you know, random uh, or magic, that there's a cause for it. Now, the sense that all things have a cause, has been, the as I've said before, as I said before, has been a, a point of discussion for thousands of years, and I'm going to eventually go over some of that, but not today. That's all you really need to, to grasp is that there is a cause, is known by intuition. As a matter of fact, we understand change in terms of our intuition of causation. So, for instance, a small child, uh, even a baby that can hear and see and sitting up, if they hear a sound that they've not heard before, they'll look for the source of the sound. So that means it's innate. It's going to understand that change in its environment in terms of a cause, and it's looking for the cause. So we're born seeking causes. That's a sign that something is, um, is an intuition. Now, it's a larger subject, but even logic is grounded in intuitions that we're born in. If I say, um, if all boys can fly and Johnny is a boy, then Johnny can, would be able to fly. Now, the reason that I know that is because I have the intuition that truth is consistent. And that contradiction would be a sign of, uh, of some kind of falseness. So your conclusions are, are, are consistent with your premises. That's not something you could learn from logic. Logic requires that as an axiom even before you, you begin to study it. We seem to be born expecting a consistent world. Okay, I'm going to stop now. That's been 20 minutes. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what happens with that. I hope people were able to follow at least most of that. Thank you.